Uh, today, as we did today, the Swedish uh, Tammuz, coming up to Gimel Tammuz. Uh, Rabbi Brooklyn, it's Jeannie. I cannot get in. It's not letting me in. Oh, we don't let you in. No, not everybody in. Not everybody's allowed in. But she's in the room. <laughs> um, I'll open the door for you. So, um, okay. Do I buzz it in? So uh, I don't get the buzzers. I get it in the office, uh, I can, but I can. Uh, I get a buzz. It's life. So <laughs> now the Rebbe, I mean, the Gimel Tam is in the yard side of the Rebbe, and um, the Rebbe, a Rebbe comes down to reveal godliness in the world. That's what. Uh, that's the most important thing of a of a Rebbe, of a leader, a Jewish leader from Moshe Rabbeinu who uh, was the first uh, Jewish leader in Am Yisrael, uh, his avayda, his service, is to bring godliness to the world. That means even though godliness is in the world, everybody has an ashama, everybody has a godly soul. So godliness in the world, the point of a, of a nasi, the point of a tzaddik, is to reveal godliness. That the person feels godly. And uh, that's a service, and that's why the way you connect to a Rebbe, the way we're learning Tanya, we're connecting to the Alter Rebbe, the way you connect to a Tzaddik is learning to, to his Torah, learning his Torah. So even though we're learning Tanya, which is the Alter Rebbe, but most of the Tanya, the way we learn is through the teaching of the Rebbe himself, who, who, who taught the Tanya in, a, in his way of teaching, through his knowledge, his Chachma. And that's the way we learn. So in essence, we're not only connecting to the uh, to the Alter Rebbe, we're connecting here to the Rebbe himself, who is a who is a is a connection to these great tzaddikim who came about to uh, reveal godliness in the world. When a Rebbe said a maima, when a Rebbe said a discourse, in essence, opened up the opened up our eyes, he opened up gates to uh, for every one of us to be able to go uh, to go uplift, uplift ourselves. Uh, through these teachings, through these learnings, to be able to look at the at life through a different kind of a, a window, through a different kind of eyeglasses, and to be able to see life in more of a spiritual way, if we can, each one according to his capability, to be able to see to see life in a different kind of way, to be able to see the teaching of Torah in a different kind of a way, and so, and the Rebbe would always say that that uh, that the Torah. The Torah was given to every Jew. It's not over here that there's exclusivity in the in 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 the learning of Torah. That somebody has some kind of VIP uh, connections over here, because the Torah is the Chachma of the Eibushter. The Torah is the wisdom of God, which God gave every Jew. God gave every Jew, inherited to every Jew, the concept of learning Torah, the the, the capability to learn Torah, and through the learning of Torah. To have another, another, another reality. To be able to have another reality, because wherever we are in the world, maybe she knows as the as the verse says in the beginning of Genesis, God says, "I know that I've given you the challenge. I've given you your yitzhar. I've given you your your challenge in life. I, uh, it's not something that you that uh, you acquired. I've given you the challenge. You might argue with me and say why we have a challenge. Maybe she says, you know, you'll ultimately one day thank me for the challenge." Um, but ultimately, I've given you this challenge, and and I've given you all the tools. A person cannot say that he doesn't have the capability to deal with the challenge, because as Chassidus over here, the Al Tereb is explaining, as we mentioned last week, we're holding in the middle of chapter twenty-two of Tanya, I believe twenty-three of Tanya. We're holding uh, on page ninety-six, um, ninety-six, ninety-seven. The Alter Rebbe over here talks about Rotzen, which God gives the concept of will, the Rotzen of a person, that we should connect our Rotzen to God's Rotzen. Because when you have Rotzen, even in the human body, we know that every every attribute that, that we have, from wisdom to, uh, to all the ten attributes of a human being, in those ten attributes, every attribute has its place. Chachma is in the head, it's not in the heart. Emotions are in the heart, it's not in the head. Two different realities. You have to connect them together, you have to know how to infuse one with the other, but every entity has their purpose. They wish to create the hands to do action. They wish to create the feet to walk. They created the heart to feel. And they created the brain 
to think. But then he created an attribute, he created a concept which is above all of them and which ultimately affects all of them. And that is not saying that is the will of a person. Where the person's rotsin is, shamunim said, there is where the person is, wherever he might be. And you can be even physically in one place and at the same moment be in a different place because your rotsin has that power, has that capability. So you can uplift yourself. You can be in a dungeon and then be, be in a very high place at the same time. You can be happy in any place you are if you really wanted to be happy in any place you are. There's nothing, there's nothing stands within the will of a person. And a person can be wherever his rotsin wants him to be. And therefore, you should always be happy. Because that is your two, your two rotsin. That's really where your true rotsin is. Your true rotsin of a person is to be happy. And that's what the Rebbe wanted to accomplish in everybody, the concept of simcha, to be happy. Because everybody should be happy. Even though they might be in situations that is uh, maybe making them unhappy. But they should be happy nevertheless. And that is the power that God gives us each in, the, each, in each and every one of us. So therefore, we're holding a beam on the bottom of the page of 96, the left column. Here the Alter Rebbe introduces us to the concept he introduced us before already also to the concept of, of the others. As Jews, in the Torah, we call three people others, and Imois, patriarchs and matriarchs. You remember the song in, in, on Pesach? There are, three, there are three patriarchs and there are four matriarchs. Three patriarchs, others, are Avram, Yitzhak, and Yankov. The three, four matriarchs is Sar, Rivka, Rachel, and Leah. Why do we call them patriarchs? Why do we call them office? These are these are the people that lived thousands of years ago. Why would we call Avram Avinu, Abraham, our father, in this present moment that we call him? He's our father. Why would we call Yitzhak Avinu in this present moment that he's our father? He's not our father. He's not our our biological father. And the answer is because an of the concept of a father and a mother is what they give to, to, to their child, to, the, to their offsprings. What they give, to the, what they inherit to them. I don't know what we mean inherited to 120 years, but it, it, what they inherently, the, the Gemara says, what a father and mother give to their child. Not through their actions, but the inner aspects of what they give to their child. Each and every one of them give to their child something. That's why it says, the Gemara says, Alter Rebbe brings down in Tanya, in the first chapter of Tanya, that it's important, the machshava of the parents. It's important to the thought of the parents at the time of conception of their child. That, uh, that, if it, that it depends on their, their thoughts. That what was their, their thoughts at this conception that gives the quality, the characteristics to the child. That doesn't mean gives the child, gives gives the challenges. In essence, the, in essence, the, 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 the Gemara is saying that, that 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 the truth is that the uh, the challenges that the child might have might be given to them by 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 the parents, in in their thoughts in the, at the time of conception. What was their thought? What was their thought process? Were they thinking holy things? Were they thinking uh, negative things? Were they what was their thought? So we can give the character of the we can give the character to the child. The handicap that doesn't doesn't give that doesn't take away from the free free choice of the child. That doesn't mean that that you that a person that is born with had had parents who had evil thoughts means that they uh, that they have they have uh, they are incapable of, uh, of 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 accomplishing things in life. Because ultimately, the child has free choice to take his character. And use it for negativity or to use it for positivity. But it's all, in essence, the Ratzin. What was the Ratzin? Even Shlata, even Davar HaMelech says that I've been born, that's how the Goyim took the statement of Davar HaMelech, I've been born in sin. Um, uh, and uh, he meant was, Chazal say, he meant was, that his parents really was, a, was, a, was, he was his parents, if you know the story, his father didn't want a relationship with his mother and it was a mistake. The relationship they had 
the night that David Melech was conceived, was the born, it was a it was a oops, so to say. He thought he was living with somebody else. Whatever, you can go to the whole story, that story of, 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 of David Melech. <laughs> Whatever. So so David Melech expressed that in essence, I was not born in 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 a in a in a in a in a in a, in a, in a loving uh, uh, willing full relationship. I was born in a in a, not a, in a they, you know they weren't together there because they wanted to be. He was he's thinking about something else. He was maybe thinking about something. I don't know. They they came together. They created me. Uh, in, 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 <laughs> But it worked out well for him. But we know that Dovr Melech, Dovr Melech, was a struggling Jew. With all his greatness, he was not. He didn't have an easy life. You can look at Tillam. You can see that Dovr Melech had a struggling life. He had a struggling not only from the outside, from the inside. He struggled all his life, and uh, he bashed it, uh, overcame his struggles. But still, he struggled in life, and he expresses it in Tillam. You can look at Tillam Psalms. Dovr Melech expresses. His uh, his hardships and in, 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 in the in the life that he had, that he didn't have an easy life. But nevertheless, David Melech, free choice in his free choice, he became what he was, and he he, he overcame his struggles to become the ultimate Melech, the ultimate king of the Jewish nation. Him, all generations, the, the God gives him and his offsprings Ad Elam the Kisa Malchus, the the the, the, the throne of kingship. So we know that kingship. We know we know that kingship is not an easy thing to accomplish. To become a ruler of your existence, it comes through struggle. To become a king over yourself is not an easy thing to do, because there's too much, too many issues. Sometimes there's too many issues to overcome to become a real melech. That's why melech in it's brought down melech. The word melech, which is mem lamet kof. Which is a concept of king is ma, is, is mayach lev and covered, mayach lev and covered. Mayach is the mind, the lev, the heart, the covered, the liver, which is symbolic to the cleansing process of the blood in a human being. So to be able to have mind over manner and ultimately to sift through things in life and differentiate between uh, what is right and what's wrong. And what what uh, what should I should choose and why I shouldn't choose? It's not it's not it's a melech. It's real kingship. That's why it says Ezu Giber uh, The real giver in the Torah is not somebody who conquers a, a, a country. Upon uh, somebody who can control himself, who can have self control over himself, and and that's not an easy thing. And therefore, it should be a, a the Eibushter says I receive a real nachas ruch from that. I receive, I receive a real pleasure from this concept when a Yid becomes a Melech, when a Yid becomes his, his own king, so to say, when a Jew overcomes that challenge. It's not something that I take for granted because I know the challenge I give him. I know exactly the challenges that I give him. You should realize another greatness of a Rebbe. Why do Yid go to a Rebbe for a bracha? Why why do we go to a Rebbe? Go to the Abishta for a bracha. Good God for a bracha. Why do you need to go to a Rebbe for a bracha? Really? Go to the Abishta. Go to God. That's your that's daven every day. So why would you go to a Rebbe for a bracha? And the answer is, first of all, that any name, anybody can give a bracha. Whoever gives a bracha, the Gemara says, no bracha should be simple in your eyes. If the Jew gives you a bracha, it's a, a yid can give a bracha. You know the Jew can give you a bracha, and it should give you a bracha. And you should be, uh, you should, you should give brachas. You should give blessings. So we give you a bracha, Elliot. We should give you a full shleima. It's not a, even though we're not on my at least over here. So uh, you know, whatever. Don't be sad. A bracha is not a simple thing when a yid gives another person a bracha. What is the great thing about tzaddik? So why you go for a tzaddik for a bracha? Because the tzaddik feels the pain of the other person. The tzaddik feels the pain of the other person. Hashem. And uh, surely Hashem too. But when a person, when another person, when the Abish, that's why when, when another person can feel your pain, to the Abish, that is an unbelievable concept in this world, to feel somebody else's pain. Most people ask you, how are you? They don't want to hear the answer. 
Only if it's a uh, you know whatever I won the won the lottery, but uh, if that yeah, I don't, you know how you know really the people want to hear tzaddis. People don't want to hear another person's tzaddis, but they don't want to put themselves in that situation because a lot of times they cannot put themselves in that. You can't even blame. Them. They cannot put themselves in that situation. It's difficult to put yourself in a situation of somebody else's real tzad, somebody else's real pain. When the Abish just says, the Khalsa Rasam late Sar, when the game God says that I am in with you in your pain, it's not just a nice uh, you know uh, headline. The Abish just says, I'm with you in your pain. I'm with you in your pain. When the Abish just says, when you say in your Haggadah, that Leode Malach, Leode Shliach, but the Abish himself came down to Mitzrayim. It's not a, it's not a, it's a very deep concept. You should realize that concept. That when you say in your Haggadah, we say that the Abish to God himself, not through an angel, not through a, what would be bad if you came through an angel or through a, what, what would be so terrible? Well, well, that's also great. What's the difference? At least we get out of Gala. So who cares that the Abish himself came down? To, to Egypt. What 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 is what what is what is what is important? <laughs> that's later on. But the Abish thing that's that's later on. Yeah, that's later on. That's later on. But the but the Abish just says that I am I am I am uh coming down to to, to you, Mitsnayim. The Abish still wants to tell you that he is here in your pain. Like a tzaddik who when he when he hears another Jewish pain, he is in the pain. He is in the pain of another Jew. There's a beautiful word yesterday on the Pasha. You see, if you listen to the Pasha, you'll see that, the, that it mentions three or five, four times in the Pasha. There's a Bakrita here. Vayipal upon of Rabbeinu fell on his face. And it keeps on saying that, and then it says, Moshe and Aaron fell on their face. Vayipal upon of. And one time it says in the Pasha that, that Moshe Rabbeinu, that God says to the Moshe Rabbeinu, Uplift yourself in this congregation. Uplift yourself from this from these people. And I'll get rid of them. And what happens? What, what does Meshach Rabbeinu do after that statement? He falls down on his face. And the Farshim say that Meshach Rabbeinu says, no, I don't want to uplift myself from the people. I want to actually go down to the people. I want to actually go in their pain. I don't want to uplift myself from this situation. I don't want to uplift myself as, a, and he could have. He self understood. Moshe Rabbeinu was uplifted from the situation. He was greater than the situation. He had nothing to do with this whole situation. As he tells Kedar, I'm nothing involved in this situation. You have the problem with God. You don't have a problem with me. It's not. A, you're not having a fight that there's two people fighting over here. You're having a fight with yourself. You're having a fight your own personal struggle. It's nothing to do with me because Gazuk uh, hey, take over everything. If God says it's yours, I give it over. I'm. I'm not. I'm not gonna. I'm not demanding anything over here. Neither is my bro brother Aaron demanding anything over here. But when the Abish says to Moshe Rabbein, Aribu, uplift yourself in this community and, uh, and you know, step, step, so to say, step up. Moshe Rabbein says, no. Moshe Rabbein says, no, I'm going to be part of this situation. I want to be part of the situation. And the, no, he said, look at the word, Arimu, uplift yourself. And 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 Moshe Rabbeinu responds by Yipapana. He falls. He falls down to the ground, which which. So this sages tell us that Moshe Rabbeinu says, "I'm a tzaddik. I care about the people. I'm not here to 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 do something negative to the people. I'm, fine, I'm trying to figure out a way to uplift the people, not to not to uplift myself on the people, but actually, how do I how do I feel the pain of the people? So maybe I can give them." Uh, give them a way to uplift themselves. Yeah. So I was reading this job as uh, Rabbi Sachs had an essay. Um, oh, I'll try. <laughs> uh, this job as I was reading Rabbi Sachs on yeah. what you were talking about, and he said that part of why uh, Moshe Rabbeinu couldn't go into Israel is because he did take personally uh, yeah. the the responsible. And he did, you know, he didn't act like in a leadership role, but it was personalized. That's a medrash. You can go from here and there and never ending. Whatever. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. You can go, you can give a farish to Teda in many different ways. 
selfless to so there's a lot of but concepts in it a lot of concepts in it. but that that it, later on Mishra Benu doesn't answer Tzlofchad the Gemara says why doesn't he answer Tzlofchad because he felt he was he felt he was Mishra Benu felt he was involved even though Hitaka wasn't but again uh, the uh, Mishra Benu felt in, in a certain level in everything that he did he was involved Mishra Benu took upon himself that his that the Eden didn't go on into Edsol because of the fault of his leadership. He didn't take it in the fault of the people. He took it as the fault of his leadership that he wasn't the ultimate leader, and uh, and therefore he doesn't deserve uh, any kind of uh, uh, any kind of credit in this situation. But the Abish, but that's that's not even of Moshe. Self understood. That's the humility of Moshe Rabbeinu. That 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 he, that he felt that he that he that he took the responsibility, and that's the greatness of leadership. That even if it's not your responsibility, it's your responsibility. Because if you're a leader, you take responsibility. That's a famous gemara. The gemara says that uh, that a person that murders somebody unintentional, uh, the kayan, he's he's in he's in he's in this he's in the city of refuge until the kayan gadol passes away. What does the kayan gadol have to do with his uh, his unintentional murder? But the Kayan Gadol has to take responsibility. He has to take as a Kayan Gadol, as a person who represents Yidin to the Abish, it's his responsibility, even though it's not his responsibility. Who's going to blame the Kayan Gadol? The Yankel killed somebody. Uh, what does he have to do with it? What does he have to do with him? He has nothing to do with him. It's not his brother. It's not his uncle. He's not his uh, friend. It's not Jew living. Who knows with it? But it's a Kayan Gadol's responsibility. That's true leadership, not running away from responsibility, but taking responsibility. And uh, that was my shot. But that's really, in essence, it's their responsibility. It is their responsibility. They took upon themselves the responsibility. So let's go to here. So the Alta Rebbe said, this is why the sages men, when they said the patriarchs were truly a chariot of God. Now we understand why the Zoya, when the Zoya wants to say the greatness of Avraham, Yitzhak, why we coined them as obvious, as patriarchs, of the Jewish nation, we don't give this name. We, they, they, the sages didn't throw out names when they called the when they called the uh, uh, when they called the office the patriarchs. When they called Moshe Rabbeinu, Rabbeinu, when they called the when they called the a, a person a Nasi, these were not names that they just gave out labels. These were names that were connected to who they are to emphasize the greatness of uh, uh, or what they brought to uh, to Am Yisrael. And what did they bring to Am Yisrael? The patriarchs is that they were a chariot of God, meaning that they were taka true parents, others, parents. They lost, their in, they lost their individualism as humans, as regular people. Others, they became others. They became parents. Parents, they became, they became, they gave up their identity in a way. Which that's a good parent, a parent that gives up his identity. Comes a parent. And 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 therefore, in Taylor, you can be a parent, whether you're physically a parent or not physically a parent. Everybody can be a parent. When uh, when uh, Avram Yitzhak gave themselves up for Jews. For the future generation. Think about it. If you in, in a simple term, Avram Yitzhak gave up their life. For a promise, not even to them, right? Not even to their immediate offsprings, not even to the like generations of generations ahead of them, right? So Avraham Avinu was promised at it to so. They got it hundreds of years later, four hundred years later, right? So it's his great, 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 great. I don't know what number. Okay, it's a lot of numbers. Whatever generations. It's like, it's like 10 generations later. Imagine you say, give your life away for 10 generations later. Who's going to do that? Unless God asks you. <laughs> <laughs> God, God does ask you. God does ask you. Give yourself away for a for, 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 for greater, greater, greater cause. We're not ready to give ourselves away to greater cause. Totally. We all surrender. have surrender. Surrender for a greater cause, right? The, the Abish says, "Give yourself away for the cause, for the Jewish cause." Who's ready to give themselves totally to the Jewish cause? It fits into my schedule. 
uh, I, I, I'll give, I, I, I'll, I'll donate some time. Say, I'll give a charity of time. Maybe she's looking for, for, for a donation of, of, of a volunteer. This is volunteerism. This whole, this whole thing is to volunteer yourself. You, you mean you have a busy life, but you can find some time where you can volunteer your time. Volunteers never uh, pander out in the long run. <laughs> Maybe that's why it's a job. Not a volunteer. You're getting, you're getting paid. Well, we're the workers of the day. We get paid. Right? But really, it's a, it's a life commitment. Ebishter wants a life, wants, wants a commitment. Wants a commitment. Really, the Ebishter wants a commitment more than, he, than, than anything else. The commitment itself. The concept of a commitment. Right? Well, what did the Jews do by modern Torah? They, they, they set a commitment. They didn't know the Torah yet, right? Even before the Torah was given, the Ebishter wanted us to commitment. Are you committed? Right? When you go into the chuppah, you get married. Right? You're committed. Nobody knows what's going to happen. That's why some of us have sodas. <laughs> <laughs> because when they were, then you get married, and then you realize, wow, this is a, 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 this is more than just a commitment. This is more than just a party. This is a, this is obligations. There's obligations and there's strings attached. A lot of strings attached. Right. That's why you heard the joke that life is like a tea bag. First, it makes sense. <laughs> then you get the hot water. But then you realize like, the strings attached. So, um, uh, <laughs> right. So uh, it, 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 it's a commitment. It's not easy. That's why people struggle with it in the concept. The relationship is a struggle. They wish to want a commitment. Are you committed? Then we'll go to the next step. If you don't have a commitment, then, then how we can go to uh, the next step of obligations and responsibilities? We need a commitment. Are we committed to each other? Yes or no? Let's be committed. And then, once you're committed, you're, in, you're in, in two sides already. You're committed to the institution. And that's really Kabbalah. That's why the Torah says the most important thing is Kabbalah soil, accepting the yoke of heaven, the commitment. Right? We know it's going to be a struggle. Things you want to do, things you don't want to do, things you agree with. But are you committed? Right, so therefore, even if you fall, even if you fall aside, you you'll fall away from it. You'll be, you'll still be committed. If you're not committed, then the second something's a challenge, and you're out. And therefore, the patriarchs were totally committed. And that's what you think about it. The patriarchs are never given one commandment. Their greatness was their commitment. Hineni, whatever they wish to want, Hineni, the commitment. They were not commanded one mitzvah, even though the Chazal tell us the message says that they did all the mitzvahs, but they were never commanded besides one mitzvah, Brismillah, Bavram Avinu. Right? Well, what was their greatness? They were committed. First drive of his vehicle, the chariot of God. Correct. Hineni, that's why uh, Avram Avinu's statement is Hineni. Here I am. And that's why you can overcome all your challenges. That's why it says that Avram Vin had 10 challenges and he overcame all the challenges. Why? Be because he was committed. When you're committed to a, to, a, to a journey, when you're committed to a concept, doesn't mean you're going to have an easy time, but you're committed. You're committed. You're committed. That's the young ones. Yes. The great Esther Youngblood yeah. wrote a sure. book, Hineni. The Committed Life. Oh, Hineni. Committed well, that was an organization. But her organization was uh, Hineni. Here I'm life. Here I am. Here I am. That's it. Hineni. Here I am. It's going to be uh, not totally, I'll be, but I am. I could be, I'll be a 10%. I'll be a 20%. I'll be a 50%. i will try to be a 100%. But I'm here. Hineni. The Commitment. That's why the Mishnah says in Pirkei Avot, "Lo yalecha amlacha ligma." You're not allowed. You don't have. You don't have to obligate to finish a job, but you cannot give up on it. You got to be committed to the job. Nobody, unless you're a tzaddik, you can complete a job. 
As a Jew, you've got to be committed to the job. Sometimes you do it 100%, hopefully. Sometimes you do 50%. Sometimes you do 25%. Sometimes you bet you're committed. That's what the Rebbe said. There's a mistake. I put it on my Facebook last week. That there's a mistake that people divide Jews between religious Jews and non-religious Jews. It's a mistake. Don't just think as a religious Jew or non-religious Jew. Every Jew is committed. We're all committed. Some people are doing more, some people are doing less. That doesn't change the commitment. Doing more, doing less doesn't change the, the, the initial commitment. Sure, everybody should be 100%. No, no question about it. Why, but like a marriage. It doesn't make a difference here, a perfect marriage or an imperfect marriage. You're still married. Right? Still married. Still marriage. Not every marriage is 100% perfect. Not every marriage is decided that if, you, 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 if you're only 10% married, then you're not, you're not married. 90% you're not married. You're married. The second you went under the chuppah, you're married 100%. You might not you might not be 100 percent happy, but you're married a hundred percent. You're married one hundred percent. There's no difference to, in the in the concept of marriage, whether you are happily married or you're very unhappily married. Whether you're killing each other or you're pushing and uh, having the most uh, most amazing time with each other. It doesn't make a difference. You're both married. We are married to God. We are committed to God. God is committed to us. Sure, we should be a hundred percent. Nobody's going. We should have a happy marriage between us and God. We should be happily married. But if we're not happily married, we're not happy. We're not married. Still married. And that's what the Abish should look. You should realize that Abish looking for a commitment. The Abish says, "I'm married to you forever." Finished. I'm committed. If you're looking for my commitment, I'm committed. For all the organs were completely holy. That's the, so by them, they were totally committed. They had no issues. That's why they say in the title, you look at Avram, Yitzhak, Yankiv, these great sages, great avas, the mate patriarchs and their wives, their imais. Wherever they went out, Vayetze, Vayove, wherever they went out, that's where they came to. There was no, the journey came to a completion. They accomplished. Because they were committed to the purpose and nothing stopped them. I mean, they had a lot of challenges on the way, but it didn't get them off their purpose. They went out, they came. They reached, they reached their purpose. By us, we go out and we get fablunged. We get fablunged. We want to go, we want to, you know what I mean? Fablunged. We get lost on the way. Right? We will, everybody wakes up in the morning and they want to accomplish and they want to do a great day. And we get fablunged suddenly in the, in, in, in the course of the day. We suddenly get sidetracked. And then we forgot that we got up to have a good day. We got up to who wakes up in the morning to have a bad day. We got up to have a great day. We get for Blungeon. Suddenly we are lost. We're lost on the way. Why? Because it should that should be your 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 that should be your, your focus. And that should be your goal. Isn't the soul about developing a more more consciousness? So that's it. Melch, that's consciousness, Malchus. You have you have moyach shal el chayil mind over matter. Matter is giving you problems. The mind tells you that you gotta keep focused. You cannot let the problems distract you. you can't let the problems take you over. And that was the patriarch. That's why they were called a the chariot. They were a chariot. Who said they're giving themselves over to the purpose, to the, to the committed. They're committing themselves to a purpose. That's why the Mgwala says that every Jew should say, Every Jew should say to himself, I want to be like that way. 
I want to be that way. I want to be that way. I want to be a person who has a purpose. I want to be a person who knows his purpose and is focused on his purpose and does his purpose. And, 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 and you know, like the Rebbe said uh, last week on Thursday, that what was the expression in, in the Sikha we learned here? The Rebbe said that if a person doesn't know his purpose, if a person doesn't know his purpose, he, there's a lack in the whole creation. He should realize that it's not only that it's a lack in his service and what he, he's, he's missing something in his own journey. It's in the journey of the world. Because everybody was created for the purpose of the world and he has to find his purpose and he has to make it a the pole, so to say, at the front of you. You have to create that purpose in front of you and you need to not divert from the purpose. And it's not an easy thing to do. But you have to do it. That's what you have to do. Because if not, you're going to get fablunged. You're going to get lost on this crazy world, crazy journey that each and every one of us goes in, goes through in life. So serving as a vehicle solely for the supernal will alone throughout their lives. And that was the Ovis. That was the Patriot. What is our purpose? In a simple way, what is our purpose? Our purpose, maybe he gave us that pole. He gave us that purpose. He gave us, he didn't hide from us. He didn't say, everybody says, ask me, so what's my purpose? It's no secret. The general purpose that the Abish gave each and every one of us in a very particular way, he gave us the, uh, the Torah. He gave us the Torah. And the Torah that he gave each and every one of us is something that each and every one of us can learn. It's simply a learning process. Because you need to learn your purpose. It's not something that, that you, 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 you can find anywhere. It's something that you have to learn. A purpose is a learning process. <laughs> and then you learn the Torah and you take your character and now put it together. Take the, take the learning, go learn Torah. Learn Chumash every day. Learn Torah and say, okay, now how do I take that learning? Does what I learned today have anything to do with me? al Rebbe said the famous <coughs> statement that a Jew should live at the times. And what he meant was the Parsha of the week. Not that every week has another parsha. It's not just because uh, the sages wanted to figure out oh, how to, uh, you know, how to divide the Torah up into fifty-two uh, weeks. No, every portion has something to do with the Jew that opens up the Chumash that day, and try to figure out what does the today's portion have to do today's reading that you read today or you're going to read today. What does this Pasha have to do with me? Might not be easy. <laughs> and therefore, sometimes you got to learn the commentaries. Maybe you can find there, what does the portion have to do with me? Right? So this portion of today, Chukas, we start the, the law of Apollo Duma, the red heifer. What does the red heifer have to do? What is this pus? What is this? Is, what does this whole thing have to do with me? How does this connect to me? How does it connect to me today? Right? And I cannot tell you what it is because every person has to learn Torah themselves. I have to learn the Torah and figure out what does it have to do with me. Now you've got to learn the Torah and figure it out. What does it have to do with you? And that's what the Mishnah says. It's a very important Mishnah. 
The Mishnah says, if a person says, I've searched and I've not found, don't believe him. And if a person would even say, I didn't search and I found, don't believe him. Because it's not an easy thing. person that says, I've searched and I've found, you believe him. Because you got to search. It's not a kindergarten rhyme book. Teda has within it, supposed to came, the Teda came to give you, to uplift you today. And this week is Pasha Chukas. So whenever a person asks a person, what is this week, is Pasha Chukas. The whole week is Pasha Chukas. The week of Chukas. The Rebbe would say, what is the lesson, general lesson of the week? Is that it's engraved. Chukas means it's engraved. It's engraved within you. And that's why it's the deepest concepts of the Torah is today actually in this week's portion. Starts off this week's portion that even Shleim HaMelech says, I cannot comprehend this, this mitzvah. I cannot comprehend the Pod Aduma. It's far behind me to understand the Pod Aduma, to understand this mitzvah. Right? So the first Rashi says in this week's Pasha, the first Rashi says that this mitzvah ha- is so deep that a Jew cannot say, that, that a Jew cannot ask a question, why? Right? It's first Rashi. Einoch l'shus l'halachra. The Ebishter gave a mitzvah that demands in a Jew to say, I have no permission to ask any questions. Persia should realize the depth of Teda, the, the wisdom of God, that he should ultimately say, I don't have a right to ask a question, even though I do ask questions. And I do demand explanation, but really the truth is, I don't have a right to ask any questions. Really, in the depths of the issue, as a yid, I don't have a right to ask any questions. It's the chokhmah of the Abish, it's the wisdom of God. How can I ask a question? So if a big professor came in and gave a lecture, uh, you're going to ask a question. Right? You're going to ask a question. You don't even understand what he's talking about. You're going to ask a question. But we have chutzpah as Jews. We ask the question. But that we realize only because we have chutzpah. Everybody, everybody has to say something. So they have to ask a question show somebody else that's smart. But the truth is, you don't have a right to ask a question because it's too deep for you to even ask the question. The concept is truly much more deeper than the question you're going to ask. You have the right to ask the question. I'm not saying you don't have the right to ask the question. But ultimately realize, as Shleim HaMelech said, I asked the question and I realized that it's too deep for me. That that, that not everything I can understand. And the truth is, that's the beauty of this concept. That a person should ultimately ask the question. I'm not saying you should not ask the question. The person that Shleim HaMelech asked the question, Mishra Beinu asked the question, what is the mitzvah? Everybody asked the question. And you go, there's a lot of ink spilt on this Pasha. Chukas, ask the question. What is the paraduma? What is its meaning? What is it? What is it teaching? What is its uh, comprehension? Ask the question. You're entitled to ask the question. But you, you have to come sometimes to the conclusion that some things are beyond me. Some things are beyond And what does it show on me? Even in myself, there are certain things that are chokuk in me, that are engraved in me. They're engraved in me. You see that certain things touch different people. Different things touch different people. Could you explain a little bit about the relationship or what chukas means in terms of engraved? What's the... Engraved means it's, it's engraved with like a stone or something's engraved. When something's engraved on a stone, then the stone becomes the engravement. That's the difference between something that's written on parchment or something that's engraved, like a matseva is engraved. So yeah. something that's on parchment, it's the parchment and the letter are two different entities. But, what but, uh, means- but, uh, but uh, engraved means is a stone. The stone is the, 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 the words. The stone is the word. It's not something that is uh, separate from it. It is part of him. 
That's why chedus and chorus come from the same word. Chedus is freedom and chorus is the engraved. You are, each and every one of us, are true free people. Because it's engraved, it's, it's who we are. It's not something, that's why Ein Lach Ben Chayden, the Mishnah says, a person who's not, is truly not free. If you think world gives you freedom, world gives you slavery. It's a different kind of slavery, but the world <laughs> gives you slavery. Because that is world. World is the concept of slavery. World dictates to you to be in a certain kind of a way. And that's Helem. That's why in Kabbalah, Siddhis, world is Helem, is darkness. So most of us think, that, oh, the world is free. No, the world is not free. Because the world forces you to be in a certain kind of a way. It demands of you to be in a certain kind of a way. The Torah says you should be totally free. You should have total freedom, total bechira chafshis. Total freedom. Because that is engraved in you. That is engraved in you. It's who you are. The family fathers, even in America, understood that concept. In a way, in a small kind of a way. The Abish that created himself in his image. We all created in the image of God. Freedom and liberty. They themselves only meant, you know, men and, and white men and etc. But uh, <laughs> it was not it was not total humanity. <laughs> so there were limitations. To their freedom. <laughs> because because, because you must not understand true freedom. It's a limited freedom. David still wants true freedom. God really wants true freedom. He wants every individual to, to be free. And to serve himself and serve the Abish, to serve humanity. Sir, be free. Be an open Vessel. Right? Be a melech. Be your own king. Be your own ruler. The Abish gave Malchus to each and every one of us. Malchus, be a king. Be a, be a ruler over yourself. Be free. What's well, a king? Right? Good to be king. Right? Don't we say that? It's good to be king. Why? Because a king can do whatever he wants. Be your own king. Be your own melech. Right? Don't be the, don't be under the dominion of anybody. Be under the dominion yourself. So, I guess where I got confused is that uh, you said chukas uh, means a grave. Great. Does that mean that the paraduma, the idea of the paraduma, is a grave in that? Yeah, <laughs> it is. Because the part of doom and cleansiness, cleansing and impurity is not a concept of knowledge. Oh. Nobody can comprehend the concept of that you become, they take you, take you, you're pure and you're pure. What is that? I can take a shower a whole day, I'm still impure. Mm -hmm. Right? So, what, what is the pshat? What is the pshat, uh, purity and impurity? It's, a, it's totally elusive. It's totally an elusive concept. People took it as a, oh, you're clean, you're unclean. Physically cleanliness and spirit and physically uncleanliness. Uh, it's not at all of that. It's not at all that. So it's not at all that. But people took it that way. So you talk about oh, dead bodies and pure. You touch a dead body, you become impure. What happens exactly? You touch this dead body, what happens? Oh, I changed my mechala, my uh, What? No, it has nothing to do with your neshama. Let's do with your goof. What do you do? Shaman can't get tainted. Shaman can't get tainted. Let's do with your goof, whatever that means. <laughs> Again, it's uh, the, the goof becomes impure. It's such a deep concept to comprehend this concept. That a woman becomes impure, that a man becomes impure. All these concepts of purity and impurity. 
And that, how do you go to, you go to the mikvah? Suddenly I took myself in the water and I, I become pure. How does that work? How does that work? I take the red heifer and I sprinkle it. What is this? <laughs> What's going on over here? It's a, it's, 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 it's a total, total above comprehension. And especially in the Torah, that was his problem was the Shlomo's problem that the person who pures, he becomes impure. How does that work? How does the Torah work? The person who makes the Pirate Hefe becomes impure and this thing purifies. How does the one thing do two things? How does the same thing that purifies makes him, you, makes the, the Kayan impure? That doesn't make any logical sense. Even if I want to bring into holy logic, how is that possible? How is the purity, how does something that makes something impure make something pure? It has a paradox within itself. So how does that happen? These are deep concepts. How do we have that we are perfect and imperfect at the same time? No, we, the, 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 that's why it says it's a, the Mishnah in Piki office yesterday, I was learning yesterday, the Mishnah says, Altia Rasha Bifniatsmah. Don't the Altarab basis starts the whole time with this with this statement of Pirkei Avis. Altia Rasha never be wicked in your own eyes. That means even if you know you're wicked, Altia Rasha never say you are wicked. You can say you're doing wicked. Never say you to yourself that you're wicked. That you are wicked. You're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to do that. It's a Mishnah. Pick your office. Do not look at yourself as wicked. Because your core, you're not wicked. To the core who you are, you're not wicked. So you think about it. We take two Mishnahs, and that's why three Mishnahs makes some sense. You have one Mishnah that says, you're not allowed to be wicked. You're not allowed to say you're wicked. Another Mishnah says, you're not allowed to judge somebody else to be wicked. And the third Mishnah says, we're all righteous. Now it makes sense. You're, you're not allowed to say you're wicked. Nobody's allowed to tell you you're wicked. And therefore, we're all righteous. Now, even though we know that there are other Mishnahs that say it a little bit differently, right? We know. Because you have to take each Mishnah in itself. You have to take each Mishnah in itself. So we know that the Mishnah says that you're not allowed to be wicked. Now, what, what do you do with the whole Muslim movement? <laughs> they do this Mishnah too. So in essence, you have to know that you, do, you might be doing wicked. You have to know just like you're not allowed to judge somebody else. You shouldn't call yourself wicked. You shouldn't say, I'm a wicked person. I'm doing wicked things. I got issues. But I am wicked? No, I'm not. I'm a bad person? No. Once you label yourself as wicked, then how do you expect to become better? I'm a wicked person. I'm an alcoholic. I'm a depressed person. Everybody gives themselves a different label. I'm an alcoholic person. I'm a depressed person. I'm an unhappy person. I'm, a, I'm an angry person. We put labels. Yet on Yom Kippur, we say our hate. Yeah, but that's between us and God. So, so the Abish knows who you are. Between you and God, you confess to the Abish. You don't confess to anybody else. You don't confess. No confession to yourself either. Calling yourself wicked is not gaining anything. Well, actually, it says, I have sinned. So it's an action. That well, doesn't make you... Right. The action. hundred percent doesn't. That's the difference. You're not a not a wicked person. That's it. You you're not a wicked. Uh, you're doing wicked uh, things, but you're not uh, a wicked uh, person. This Nebuchadnezzar didn't create anybody wicked. Amen. God did not create anybody wicked. Not even Amen. Nebuchadnezzar doesn't create wickedness. That's it. People do wickedness, but Nebuchadnezzar didn't create anybody wicked. So everybody to his source is not wicked. He does a lot of wicked things. And sometimes he does a wicked thing that cannot be rectified and therefore the Torah tells you you have to put him to death. You have to eradicate this wickedness because it's just impossible that the world should go on 
with such a wickedness in the in their midst, in our midst. But a person, a human being, was not created that he is in his core wicked. You're talking about the soul, like you're distinguishing between the yeah. soul and the neshama. Yeah, 100%. So there's a great difference. Is it, uh, the the yeah. 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 yeah, nobody's perfect. Nobody's perfect. Nobody's perfect. Therefore, the truth is, how do you judge wickedness? Is there a person in the world that not the world? Russia? So everybody's wicked. So what's the difference between, that's why it says that you shouldn't judge anybody. Because what's the difference if you are one sin, you have 20 million sins. There's no difference. You're Russia. You're Russia. The Alter Rebbe told the Chassid yesterday in the in the in, in yesterday in the uh, Yom Yom. If you read it, the Alter Rebbe told the Chassid that when it comes in 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 the physical world, the physical and the spiritual are so opposite that in the physical world, the Mishnah says, "Who is wealthy? A person who's happy with what he has." And in the spiritual world, if a person is happy, what is that? That's the worst deficiency. That's the worst deficiency that you can have. It's to say that I'm happy with what I have. So that's a, if a person says I'm happy with what I have in the spiritual world, he's already a Russia. He's a wicked person. Spiritually, meaning, oh, so you know, I have enough spirituality. Right, so that's a defect. That's a, that's a rush in a defect in the in spiritual world. In a spiritual world. That's the worst kind of attitude you can have, that I'm finished. I'm accomplished. I'm happy with, with my spiritual life. I'm satisfied. In the, in, in the physical world, that's the best. Right, and there should be no end to spirituality. There's no end. And we should try to keep on doing better and better. In the spiritual world, we should never be satisfied in our spiritual existence. We should always try to do more. The Rebbe would always say that when the person would come tell the Rebbe, I'm satisfied. He would talk to the Rebbe, I'm satisfied with you. He said, I'm not satisfied. <laughs> How can you tell me? I'm not satisfied. I'm not satisfied. I'm not satisfied. I'm not satisfied. Whatever I've done, I'm not satisfied. I'm not satisfied. I want more. One more. Why should I be satisfied in, in my avoid, in my life, in the service of, of, of God, in the service of others? How can we one be satisfied in that concept? It's impossible. That's it. That's it. hundred percent. But that satisfaction shouldn't bring you depression. Mm. What brings us to depression is not being satisfied in our physical work and thinking that we're not humans, we're not we're not good. That's the problem. We're not good. We're not, we're not, we're not, we're not perfect. Oh, look at God's punishing me and this and all these expressions that I hear go through my ears. No, maybe she loves everybody. Everybody has to be happy with his lot. And we should continue to, to thrive spiritually. To continue to be better. Yeah, this is not an easy thing. It's not an easy thing to accomplish. But it's something that really is important to us to accomplish this concept within our lives. And the Abishta gave us that capability. The Abishta gave us that capability to do. <laughs> Time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> so, okay, we'll continue. And uh, God give us all a wonderful uh, week and a wonderful Chaydish. If anybody wants to uh, write a letter to the Rebbe, I'm going tomorrow to New York, tomorrow afternoon. For Gimel Thomas, the Rebbe's yard site. So I'm going to be going tomorrow night to New York. If you want to write for me a letter, you can bring it tomorrow to Chabad or email to me. Yes. And you can send it to me, zalambuka at yahoo.com. And I'll gladly bring it on Tuesday, Be'ezrat Hashem, with the help of God. To the Ohel on Tuesday morning. Have a wonderful and beautiful day. Wonderful. Thank you, Rabbi. God bless you.